This is a map of Colombia. Then this is the place where Pablo Emilio Escobar produced one billion dollars worth of cocaine every single month and sold every little bit to people all over the USA. But how did he transport over one billion kilos of cocaine all the way to the US without getting caught? Well, that wasn't an easy job. Pablo Escobar didn't start with over a thousand people to produce, transport, and sell all drug products for him. In fact, he wasn't even the boss of the smuggling operation when it all started. Right then, he was just a guy with a dream to become the biggest drug lord of all time. And he was willing to do anything. He knew he had to start somewhere. So he decided to take a big risk, all by himself. He would fly solo on a small plane and smuggle cocaine into the US for the first time. You see, in the early 70s, the most common way of smuggling drugs was through mules. People who swallowed small doses of drugs and traveled on commercial flights to the US. But here's the thing. With cocaine's rise in popularity, brought on by disco clubs and celebrities, the drug entered a phase of high demand. Smuggling small doses just wasn't enough anymore. And that was a huge opportunity, and Escobar knew it was all well worth the risk. Pablo's first cocaine shipment to the United States landed in 1970 in a Piper PA-18 Super Cup. The small craft would be vital in Escobar's early years of smuggling cocaine, becoming a nostalgic item to him. As a lightweight craft, this monoplane with just two seats and a single engine is a common choice for military training but it also offers a wide array of features fit for crime. The plane has a high lift wing, making it useful for bush flying. When you're smuggling cocaine, you certainly won't have a nice landing strip waiting for you. So having a plane able to work on rough terrain is a must. Besides, due to its flaps, the plane can take off and land in as little as 300 feet of space and fly at low altitudes, which helps with hiding. This plane may have saved Escobar from arrest several times, so it's no wonder it became so important to him. Proof is, after the plane was retired, it became a monument in Hacienda Napoles, Escobar's infamous 20 square kilometer estate. But if it was so useful, why was the plane retired in the first place? It seemed impossible, but demand for cocaine rose even higher in the mid 70s. Escobar realized that to take control of the total market, a lone operation and small craft wasn't enough. So he recruited a team, and he bought a bigger, stronger plane, a Cessna. Compared to the Piper Super Club, the Cessna is a slightly larger civil utility aircraft. It has more powerful engines with 210 horsepower and higher fuel capacity. Its lightweight lets it fly up to 1,289 kilometers which made it perfect for patrolling borders, flying for fun, and smuggling drugs. Now it was time for a new team. Escobar recruited US contacts Carlos Leder and George Young for the new operation. However, the rising drug lord wasn't able to trust anyone without making sure they would obey all of his commands. When Escobar and Jung met, Pablo proclaimed, I have one rule. You betray me, and I'll have to kill you. To which George replied, Well, you'll never get to kill me because I'll never betray you. Despite the tense beginning, this partnership would be an astounding success. In 1977, a Cessna carrying 250 kilograms of cocaine made the first flying shipment to the US. This operation granted the group a jaw-dropping 15 million US dollars. Escobar's idea was a success. Now he could oversee supply and processing while Lider and Jung were in charge of smuggling. Business was rising fast. The group spent most weekends in 1978 flying from the Bahamas to Escobar's Colombian property, where they would pick up 500 kilograms of cocaine before transporting it to the United States. Pablo Escobar industrialized the drug business, and the money flowing in and out was so big that it affected the US economy. Miami was cocaine's hotbed. The amount of money coming in was unbelievable. Pallets upon pallets of cash laid in the Federal Reserve Bank. Most of the time, Miami's Federal Reserve Bank had more cash than all of the Federal Reserve Banks combined. With that level of power and money, it seemed that no one could stop Escobar's gang. Or could they? 
In the late 1970s, Escobar and his partners tried to take over the business by paying people to kill their competitors. This decision led to the Cocaine Wars, which lasted from 1978 to 1981. The attention caused by the conflict led Escobar and his group to open a new path for drugs to the U.S. through the Caribbean. Leader bought Norman's Cay, a five-mile Long Island in the Bahamas. Planes from Colombia would stop at this island before continuing to Miami on their last leg. However, the Drug Enforcement Agency heard the Cessnas were flying to Miami, and they took action to stop that operation once and for all. But Escobar knew something about playing cat and mouse. He came up with a surprising way to beat the DEA. To evade capture, speedboats waited in international waters for low-flying planes to parachute their cocaine cargo into the water, or for freighters to drop a shipment when speedboats slid up to them. Even with the DEA breathing down his neck, Escobar was sending up to two tons of cocaine into Florida every week, which made him $5 billion. But the pursuit wasn't over yet. And if it wasn't for special help, Escobar's operation would have ended right then. By the 80s, Pablo Escobar had raised his plane fleet to ridiculous heights. The group now had a vintage DC-3, DC-4, and DC-6 cargo planes, flying at a speed of 507 kilometers per hour, transporting up to 145 tons of cocaine across the US border. Escobar then took a bolder step and brought 13 Boeing 727s from an bankrupt airline. After removing the seats, each of them could carry up to 11 tons of cocaine. But an unexpected turn of events would halt the progress of the smuggling operation. In 1983, Leader had to give up Norman's K, the group's central base of operations. With the DEA still in pursuit and no safe haven for them, how would the cartel keep taking drugs to the US? To solve this problem, the Medellin cartel asked Manuel Noriega, Panama's dictator, for help. The group rerouted their drugs through Panama, which were now smuggled by land across the US border. Danger was close, but the cartel once again evaded the DEA. Still, Escobar didn't want any other close calls, so he devised a new method to smuggle drugs that could keep the operation running even if other problems came up. Pablo Escobar used not only the skies to transport cocaine, but also the seas. And now that one of his submarines had been found out, a new chase begins. Escobar used submarines to move cocaine from Colombia to Puerto Rico. From there, it was taken by speedboat to Miami. For years, people have said that his missing $50 billion fortune could be hidden in one of the narco subs. So when news of the discovery arose, divers promptly began a rescue and search mission for Escobar's lost treasure. The Kingpin submarines could transport up to 2,000 kilos of cocaine. Rumor has it they were obtained from the Russian Navy. Submarines were a convenient way to avoid detection by law enforcement in the 80s. But unlike what we may imagine, these submarines weren't completely submerged. Instead, these semi-submersibles traveled just beneath the water's surface, with a cockpit and exhaust pipe protruding above the surface. This allowed the subs to glide through the water, leaving only a faint wake behind them. Narco subs are generally made of wood and fiberglass, and their low profile in the water makes them difficult to detect with radar. For all of these reasons, this was the perfect way to escape the DEA. Still, not even his clever method was enough to keep Escobar out of police hands. Escobar was apprehended on December 2nd, 1993, after a months-long campaign involving an American-Colombian team of investigators, drug enforcement agents, gunmen, and police. When found, Escobar began to flee, engaging in a firefight with authorities while attempting to jump between adjacent houses. Still, the drug lord was shot three times before he could escape. The king of cocaine's reign was over. The dream that had begun with a small craft in the 1970s was finally destroyed. And no one could find Escobar's lost fortune in his cocaine submarine to this day. So which one do you think was the best method for smuggling drugs? Let us know down in the comments. And if you think this story is over, you're wrong. After Pablo's death, his family still had to deal with incredible challenges. Check out our this happened to Pablo Escobar's family after he died to learn more about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.